To many observers, the financial crisis was a powerful demonstration of the need for greater transparency in financial reporting. But does forcing companies to disclose more information more frequently actually improve corporate governance? Welcome to The Big Question, the monthly video series from Capital Ideas at Chicago Booth. I'm Hal Weitzman, and with me to discuss the issue is an expert panel. Haresh Sapra is Professor of Accounting at Chicago Booth, whose research deals with issues of disclosure, transparency, and financial reporting for financial institutions. He has won numerous teaching awards, including being named one of the top-ranked professors in Business Week's Guide to the Top Business Schools. He's also a certified public accountant. Luigi Zingales is the Robert C. McCormack Professor of Entrepreneurship and Finance and the David G. Booth Faculty Fellow at Chicago Booth. He's also a Faculty Research Fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research, a Research Fellow for the Center for Economic Policy Research, and President-elect of the American Finance Association. He's a prolific op-ed writer and the author of the books Saving Capitalism from the Capitalists and A Capitalism for the People. And Scott Torb is the former Deputy Chief Accountant and Acting Chief Accountant of the Securities and Exchange Commission, where he played a key role in implementing the accounting reforms in the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. In 2007, he left the SEC and is currently a Managing Director at Financial Reporting Advisors in Chicago. Panel, welcome to The Big Question. Luigi Zingales, let me start with you. What is the basic fundamental case in favor of more transparency in financial reporting? I think that the fundamental case goes back to Justice Brandeis when he was saying that uh, the sunlight is the best disinfectant and the street light is the best policeman. Uh, the idea that uh, no sort of uh, shenanigans can take place when this is done in front of the public eyes. So transparency is a way to prevent corruption, prevent fraud, uh, prevent a misuse of uh, funds by firms, um, prevents many of the things we are worried when we're worried about uh, bad corporate governance. Scott Torb, you were right in the thick of it at the SEC. Um, just define for us, what does transparency mean uh, in financial reporting? From the perspective of uh, accountants and the accounting profession, I think we, we think that financial statements, financial reports are transparent. If a reader of those reports can understand what the company did, why they did it, and what the economic effects of those actions were. That's, I think, the, the accounting view of transparency. Okay, and, and, and Scott, is, is it your view that more transparency is always a good thing? Well, I, I think you have to define in, in what area you're, you're thinking of. Um, certainly, my experience at the SEC, we were worried about making the capital markets run efficiently. So we're concerned about efficient allocation of capital. And in that regard, Yes, I think almost always more transparency would lead to better capital allocation. So in, in that respect, you'll find regulators from the SEC tend to be in favor of transparency. Okay. Now, Haresh, uh, let me turn to you because your research paints a slightly different picture. You suggest that there's an important cost to require greater reporting requirements. Tell us about those. Well, I mean... At the end of the day, using Luigi's analogy he used, I think too much sunshine can you know, cause your skin to burn. So too much transparency, it, it's not clear that necessarily that it's a corner solution in the sense that you want maximal transparency. There are clearly costs and benefits that have to be traded off. And that's what my research shows. Uh, and other research have shown uh, that there are, there are some important benefits to transparency, clearly. Uh, it's not the idea that you know you want zero transparency. The key, I think, trade-off is what is the optimal level of transparency. As you're increasing transparency, the benefits are there, but there are certain costs that kick in, and those typically are not taken into account. Okay, so tell us more about those costs. Well, a lot of these arguments for transparency seems to rel rely that, as Scott was pointing out, that markets become more efficient, right? Because outsiders get more better information, and that's correct. And if the role of regulators is to disclose so that outsiders get better information, that's, I would uh, agree that more transparency is better. But what is missing from this argument is the fact that how firms react to this. And a lot of the arguments for transparency look at the market. They say, oh, we want to disclose more information so that outsiders all are homogeneously informed. They have information. Prices are more efficient. 
But price efficiency, research has shown, does not equate to economic efficiency, which means that are firms in turn making more efficient decisions? And in turn, is that increasing value in society? And that's not very clear. So what is the concern? I mean, what will firms do uh, in order th if there's stricter requirements? If you start increasing transparency, prices in markets will become more efficient. But then we have to understand the environments in which firms are operating. It is very possible that firms start responding to these prices and, and, and start undertaking, taking on risk or projects that make them look very good in the eyes of the market, but that's not maximizing long-term value for the shareholders. So we're talking about m sort of manipulating what they're doing in order to, to look good every quarter? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, one, one example of that would manifest itself in manipulation. You could be, you're so worried about the next earnings forecast and you know that more, more disclosure out there would make the market very sensitive to that. You start taking on projects that could potentially make you look very good in the short term, but not necessarily in the long term. So therefore, you become myopic in a sense. You, you, you basically, this more disclosure could induce you to become more myopic. And that's the danger. So okay. that has to be traded off against these benefits. Luigi's and Gallus, what do you make of that? What do you, that there are costs and we have to, there's a trade-off. Of course there are trade-offs. This is what economics is about in a sense. Uh, uh, if you never miss a flight, you waited too long at the airport. So it's not optimal <laughs> to, to catch all the flights. Uh, so uh, I think that the theoretical possibility is clearly out there, whether it is a first order consideration in practice uh, remains to be seen. And I think that uh, uh, is right that uh, any form of uh, disclosure and any form of uh, metering of performance uh, induces distortion. Even a business school, we have teaching ratings, and some professors bring the pizza the last day before uh, the valuation to increase <laughs> their ratings. That's a distortion. We don't want that to happen. Now, should we? Not, not at Booth, of course. Not, not at Booth, of course. No, occasionally also at Booth, but we have <laughs> prohibited that. Uh, but uh, do we want to abolish teaching ratings as a result of that? No. Uh, do we want to be a bit cautious and not? Uh, uh, bad everything on teaching rating because we know that if we rely too heavily on this, this will have a, a backlash effect. Absolutely. So I think that uh, RS research is extremely useful as a word of caution to make people think uh, that uh, is not uh, a one-handed word. We have, we have two hands, uh, but uh, I am concerned that it's taken too seriously in the direction of uh, uh, let's stop disclosure now because of course there is a pretty powerful lobby uh, made by firms that doesn't want disclosure. So any story. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're wrong, does it? It uh, doesn't mean that they're wrong, but uh, uh, I think that uh, once there has to be concerned about how the arguments are used, and I think that uh, some arguments can be misused. Okay, Harash. Yeah, I, I actually agree with Luigi. Uh, my, you know, the arguments we are making is not going, you know, zero transparency, as you said. There's a trade-off. I think, I think the key thing to keep in mind is too much of this debate has been on outsiders getting the information and uh, the reaction of the market. Even in, you know, uh, academic research has focused a lot on measures of market efficiency to make an argument that transparency is better. I think that's good. What, what has not been taken into account is you know, firms, you know, how, how does that have real effects on firms' behavior? I think that's very important. I think both have to be taken t together. To, to argue whether or you know, what is the optimal degree of disclosing. Clearly, in many, many cases, I would say that there is not enough transparency. Transparency has to be disclosed. But question is, do we want to be pushing in that direction, or do we want to step back and look at firms in general? Disclosure is one dial you're turning. There are other dials that, in my mind, are more effective than just disclosure. Yeah, but I, I agree with you. But uh, I would like to know practically what are the dimensions, because we agree that the feedback effect is very important. Uh, what I think we disagree is that most of the time, what I look at, the feedback effect of more disclosure is positive. So take the field of executive compensation. The more disclosure, the more boards internalize some of the concern about uh, wrong compensation, and the better the compensation is, not, not worse. So uh, I think this feedback is extremely important, must be analyzed, in many of the examples I have in mind, go in the direction of more disclosure. But I'm open to see that there are alternatives. Scott Taub. With respect to something Haresh said, uh, if it is true that additional disclosure is causing companies to make poor economic decisions, being myopic, focusing on the short term rather than the long term, and if it is the case that those are 
bad decisions. I, I'm not smart enough to know that, but if that's true, fine. That suggests to me as a regulator or as an accounting standard setter that there's something missing from the financial reports because we are apparently reporting in a way that shows short-term benefits but doesn't show possible long-term benefits. So that doesn't suggest to me that we should have less transparency but that we aren't achieving transparency. Is, is the point really about, we have, we have kind of two issues. One is about the frequency uh, of, of reporting and one is about the kind of reporting. So for example, you know, uh, firms complain that if they have to mark to market some of their trades, then they, it will distort their, their reports. Is the concern more about the frequency, that it, it, the more frequent the, the, the disclosures, the, the more distortions, or is it about the type of information? I think it's both. I think it's both. I mean, the, the key point I think Scott pointed out is, how do we achieve transparency? There are various ways you could achieve transparency. I think fair value accounting is one way that standard setters have been going after. Let's, let's value these assets of the, you know, of the banks, of the financial institutions, and just disclose them. Because you know, prices got to be better versus you know, using old prices or historical cost accounting, as they call it. Uh, so that's what, that's what, I think that's an important issue. How do you achieve it? Uh, the other one, of course, is how frequently do you disclose? You know, I mean, there's a push to disclosing more and more often. And the question is, do we start you know, forcing firms to disclose? We're quarterly right now, mandatory reporting in the US. In Europe, it's semi-annual. Do we push them to be reporting? And there, there have been some debate about pushing them to report every mo monthly, right? Because this information is already online. Why don't we disclose this information monthly? Because that's got to be better. And this is where I'll get, start getting really worried. You know, you know, I would say that, oh, if you're disclosing monthly, then the na whole decision-making nature of risk-taking becomes very short-term in nature. Luigi's and Gattis, would monthly reporting be better? I'm not so sure, but I'm not so sure that the European companies are so much uh, more uh, on a long-term horizon because they don't have to report uh, quarterly. And it says, I think that at the end of the day is an empirical statement. And I have to say, I'm not as much in this literature as you are, but I have not seen any convincing evidence that quarterly reporting uh, induces short-term behavior. I think that it might. I'm open to the theoretical possibility. Um, I've not seen evidence, and I, before I change something as important as this one, I would like to have some good evidence. Well, well you, have had, you have had financial firms you know, doing complex repo trades in order to flatter themselves every quarter, haven't you? Yeah, but that, that's government. evidence that people try, try to disguise. Uh, so that's not short-term behavior. Right. That's sort of uh, uh, financial gimmicks, and uh, uh, that's, to me, an indication that is good to report more but often because they force uh, uh, this givenness to come out. But let me, let me turn the question back to you then. Does, it, does that mean that in the US you have better corporate governance than in Europe because you have more frequent reporting? I think that uh, overall in the United States you have better corporate governance. Now why, whether this is due because of the sort of uh, more frequent reporting or part of it, uh, I don't know. It's hard to tell and I've not seen any paper that sort of uh, nails this down. But uh, in my view, is th there is no question that corporate governance on average is better. Of course, there, there are the exceptions. And I think that the transparency helps in that direction. Scott, do, do you think we're at a point where we're kind of at, at, the, at the perfect uh, stage for, for reporting? We don't want to have monthly reporting. We don't want to go back to semi-annual reporting. Is quarterly reporting kind of the perfect timetable? Quarterly reporting certainly feels right to me, but in, in part, that may be because that's all I've experienced. I can tell you that I don't feel like we need more frequent reporting. Um, although I find that firms actually do voluntarily report more frequently than that. Earnings uh, estimates and, and forecasts and things like that that are not required. Uh, firms report those and update them fairly frequently. And many of my clients will update their guidance every six, six weeks or so. Uh, so we do see that the market wants some information more than quarterly. And some firms are responding. I'm always uh, a little bit interested to know what the effects of having issued earnings guidance are because I do find that that adds uh, more impetus for companies to try to manage the result, as uh, Luigi suggested. Harish, you, you're not suggesting, are you, that we go, we go back to less frequent reporting necessarily? No, no, no not at all. Not at all. I, I, just, I just think that, that there are important costs that has been, especially by, you know, when you read accounting stand, exposure drafts from accounting standard setters, Th their whole objective function is let's disclose to make prices more efficient. 
And I think that's missing a lot of the arguments that many firms, uh, of course, firms are maybe engaged in their own objective function of taking on r risks that make them look better. But at the end of the day, if we give the firm some benefit of the doubt, I think it's important to weigh the arguments that is that should that be the role of the standard setters, which is to me seems very narrow, which is disclosing to the market without efficiency consideration, stability consideration, or anything like that. I think it's, this is a right time to step back and think about these issues, especially after the financial crisis. What about corporate governance? What would be the, what would be the one thing that we could do to, to improve corporate governance in, in terms of financial reporting? I think corporate governance itself has its own, there are instruments there that you could use. I mean, one, one, one important idea is more disclosure can be bad because you become so myopic, you focus on short-term measures. I think it's important to understand the type of contracts that we also, the, the board is writing with the uh, executives. You know, the, the contracts that they're writing on, I think the contracts are getting better since the financial crisis. Now there are clawback provisions. I think these are very important you know, instruments that you could use so that you, are, you, know, you, you bear the consequences of your decisions. So I think corporate governance can be used simultaneously with disclosure to enhance shareholder value. Luigi Zingales, what more transparency would you like to see in, in US corporate reporting? I think that uh, uh, the increased disclosure and compensation has been very useful in, uh, in chiming in this conversa these conversations where in some cases excessive, in some cases where purely structured, even the lack of uh, clawback provision, for example. I think that's, that's a, a, an issue where disclosure has been extremely helpful. Um, I think that uh, the disclosure of the, in the fin if we look at financial cooperation, the important thing is understand how solvent they are and what is the true capital. Uh, every bank that went into trouble had enough accounting equity to be considered safe by any standard measure. So that suggests that uh, those measures are useless because uh, if those banks fail, still qualifying on those measures means that they're useless. So either those measures are wrong or there was enough disclosure or a combination of the two, probably a combination of the two. Scott Torb, you were at the SEC when Sarbanes-Oxley came in. It's been a decade since. Uh, what, have, what have been the kind of the main uh, successes and, and any downside to, to that legislation? has been a, a, an awfully long decade uh, in the accounting <laughs> world uh, dealing with Sarbanes-Oxley. I, I think the biggest success is that companies take financial reporting and accounting more seriously than they used to. And that shows up in fewer errors, it shows up in fewer restatements, it shows up in more investment in the finance function within companies, uh, it, it shows up in more training. And more money paid to accountants. It, more money paid to accountants <laughs> indeed, that's true. Um, <laughs> So I think that's been the biggest benefit. And you can see that confidence in financial reporting is up. Restatements are down over the decade. It's also helped on the corporate governance side by clarifying that the audit committee should be making certain decisions and taking responsibility for certain things rather than management. I think that's been a positive as well. On the downside, there's no question it cost more than we thought it was. In fact, if, if you want to really laugh, look at the SEC's original proposal to implement the internal control reporting provisions of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. The estimated cost was somewhere around 100000 per public company. I suspect that the actual cost is at least on average four to five times that amount. And certainly for the largest companies, it is 10 or 20 times that amount. So we missed it. A and, and it has been more expensive. That's the main downside, really. What about, uh, the, there was some fear at the time that the US would be you know, uh, competing with London and Hong Kong for listings or that there would be delistings, companies would go private. H what's the evidence actually telling us about that? There's no question that some companies deregistered, went to London, Hong Kong, Toronto, uh, because we made being public in the US more expensive. So you would expect that on the margin, that's going to cause some not to do it. I think. Private companies also have not gone public as quickly on average as they might otherwise have. Those are certainly expected results, and we have not seen a mass exodus. We haven't seen a huge spate of delistings of public companies going private. In fact, I have three clients right now that were public, were taken private, and are going public again. 
So they're actually doubling up on the, the costs. They've already incurred the IPO costs once. They're doing it again. So I don't see that it's uh, really putting a, a huge break on uh, public companies. It is going private. Harish Shapur is going private. Another one of the costs that we might have, we force companies to to uh, you know, into a, a, a timetable that they're not comfortable with. We've seen examples recently like Heinz and Dell and NASDAQ in talks to go private. Uh, is that one of, one of the costs that if you force companies to do more and more reporting, they just take themselves out of the game? That's, as Luigi pointed out, a theoretical possibility. <laughs> uh, it certainly seems logical that that would happen. It seems very logical, but again, just using these two cases, you know, it's very difficult to, I mean, there are many other issues going on there, why hence and, uh, you know, it, it, it's, they're going private. Uh, but I, I, would, I would think that, I, I personally don't believe that, uh, you know, that the cost of transparency could be so high that companies would just turn off the lights and become private. But I think the cost is severe enough that they could basically, again, as I said, take on risks that are not shareholder maximization. I mean, to be honest, it's more than a theoretical possibility. I, I did do some research on this issue. And there is, there's been a clear loss, loss in competitiveness of the US market vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world that has brought to massive delisting of foreign companies. Now, US companies don't have a place to go yet so that's the reason why they don't delist, but they don't lease as much as they used to. So I think that uh, the public market has lost appeal vis-a-vis -vis the private market. Now, is just because of Southern Oxley? Absolutely not. I think it's a, a more broader phenomenon uh, made of two facts. Number one, in the rest of the world, uh, people have gotten better. And this is uh, 20 years ago, the NYC was the only place to be. Uh, today, it's not true anymore. So. Uh, it's not that we have gotten worse, it's the other have gotten better. Uh, so that, that's uh, the problem number one. And uh, the problem number two, in the United States, also the appeal of remaining private has increased. Uh, we've seen like Facebook being on this institutional market, traded for a long time before went public. Uh, you have almost all the benefits without having the cost. So in my view, and, and I've written a, a paper on this, is that the gap between the regulation that we have in the private Probably health companies and the public health is too big. And how do you fix this gap is by lowering one and increasing the other. I think there is too little disclosure, especially for large public uh, health company, privately health company, and too much if you want for uh, public health ones. Harash Sapra, you talked about uh, one of your concerns was that there was demands for ever greater uh, transparency, more and more demands or the kind of information that's released and more frequent reporting. Is that a real danger, do you think? It's a, very, it's a grave danger in the sense that I think the focus then of insiders would be worrying about what's in their you know, financial statements 30 days from now. And that's not the way, and depending on your business model, but the most business models to create value for shareholders. I find it very hard to imagine that if you're worried about producing the right numbers and analysts focusing on these, right, on these numbers every 30 days, you can really maximize shareholder value. So I, th I think it's a grave, it's a real concern. Realistically, we're, not, we're probably not going to go backwards, though, right? We're probably not going to go from quarterly reporting back to half-yearly reporting. I don't think that's going to happen. And I'm not saying that should happen. I'm just saying that, you know, we have to be very careful in weighing these costs and benefits, and this is the right time to do that. It, what is important is, while we're increasing transparency, we need to make sure that corporate governance, the auditing the, uh, framework also, is changing. I mean, one of the real uh, problems, I think, has, has been since the financial crisis is auditors are just not well equipped to understand the type of risk that financial institutions are taking. This is going in there and verifying the numbers based on the model that they have. Without understanding what these risks that the banks are taking on, they need to start understanding these risks. I mean, that's certainly been a huge criticism of the SEC. They basically have, have missed big scandals because they didn't know what they were reading. I, I think that, you know, that, that is a fair criticism both of auditors and of the SEC in the past. Um, and, and it is difficult. We, I think the public expects auditors to report on risks. Professional standards for auditors don't require them to report on risks. So there's an, an expectation gap there. And, and similarly, I think you know, your research points out an expectation gap as well. And I think you, you said it very well. Accounting standard setters focus on capital allocation, more transparency, information for investors. They do not and have not been asked to focus on how their actions affect companies' actions. So they're kind of losing the bigger picture. 
Well, it, it, they're, they're, they're not being asked to look at it. A and so the question is, do we want them to? In which case, we have a lot of changes to do to the framework. Or should somebody else be doing that? The SEC, Congress, some other body uh, that might try to balance these things. It's very difficult. The system is so interlinked nowadays, financial system. It's, uh, uh, Luigi Zingales, are we wrong to sort of focus on the, on the individual firms and, and you know, should we, should we be looking much more closely at the, at the system in general? Yeah, I think we, we, sh we should definitely sort of, uh, uh, the, the financial crisis show the interdependence of all these aspects. So we should definitely look at uh, the systemic component. But I think that uh, this is what FSOC is about, is trying to sort of see all this. So what's that? The, the additional uh, uh, board created by uh, Dodd-Frank. Right. That is uh, in charge of uh, studying uh, the risk in the market overall and so looking at the the overall perspective. So that's the job of, of government just to have a look at it. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's not necessarily something that accountancy can shed any light on though. No, I, and it's just, I don't know exactly what uh, accountants uh, are supposed to do because every time I talk to an accountant, they're not supposed to do what I expect them to do. As you said, there is an expectation gap. They're not supposed to report on risk. They're not supposed to report fraud. They're not supposed to report. What are they supposed to report? They, they, they are supposed to report fraud. Whoever's telling you they're not supposed to be responsible for fraud is just wrong. Presumably fraudulent uh, accountants. Well, on that note, uh, I'm going to call time. But my, my thanks to our panel, Haresh Sapra, Luigi Zingales, and Scott Torb. For more research, analysis, and commentary, visit us online at chicagobooth.edu slash capideas. And join us again next time for another big question. Goodbye.